You're listening to The Unsafe Bible with Pastor Ken Brown. So let's take a look at Revelation 18, verses 4 and 5. I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. Okay, so who would that voice be if it's saying it's my people? It's Jesus. It's God, okay? That's, that's who's speaking. I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not participate in her sins and receive of her plagues, for her sins have piled up as high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. If you're listening to today's message and you're living a life that looks more like the world around you than it does like Jesus, then Jesus is speaking to you today and saying, come out, come out of the world and renew your mind in my presence. You've got a choice. You can live in God's kingdom or you can live in the world and there is no in between. In today's message, Pastor Ken will lay out the choices and follow them all the way to their conclusion in the book of Revelation. Well, let's join Pastor Ken in the book of Revelation chapter 18 as he continues his message, What City Do You Live In? Now, we've discussed the possibility that when a person takes the mark of the beast, it could just be a mark, it could just be something that is able to uplink you to a computer system because we talked about that this is a worldwide net utilizing technology that's already being deployed right now by SpaceX as well as some of it that's already been deployed in terms of photo imagery that's worldwide in real time. And then you know you add 5G to it and you can have this image in three dimensions that you can see all the time. All right. But there's also the possibility that Mark could be genetic modification because the beast or the language that's used to talk about him is it makes it sound like he's been genetically modified because that's what was going on prior to the flood. They were turning themselves into things that weren't human. So it's possible that a person who's taking this mark genetically modifies themselves at that point, and they're no longer human themselves. Possible. Then again, they may still be human. We don't know, okay? It, that's all conjecture. But what we see is that the earth dwellers are, who are busy doing in the business in this city all have a common affliction. They're all demon-possessed. All of them. Okay? They're all hosts to demons. And it sounds like the demons have gone condo. That there's a bunch of them there. Recall the fifth and sixth trumpet judgments, okay? In the fifth trumpet judgment, prior to the beginning of the Great Tribulation, there was a massive demon army that was released and led by Apollyon. And we talked about who he is and the background and all that. And this demon army was so numerous it just resembled locusts. That's how you just there's so many of them, it's like locusts. And what they did is they tortured everyone who was an unbeliever for five months. All the earth dwellers were tortured for five months. Once they were done, where did those demons go? Babylon. The sixth trumpet judgment we see released at the Euphrates River. What's Babylon on? The Euphrates River. Four angels and a demon army of 200 million. And they go out and kill over one billion earth dwellers. Okay? So once they're done, where do they go? Probably Babylon, I would think. So the proclamation from the angel seems to indicate that both groups of these demons may have gone to Babylon, where due to the presence of the unholy trinity, they feel really at home. And they took up residence in many who live there. So if a person takes the mark of the beast, that's an invitation. Move in. And many have. And by the way, demons, studying them through the scriptures, and we've talked about it, they are the, I believe, the spirits of the Nephilim who were killed during the flood. They're very territorial. When Jesus went across the Sea of Galilee and cast out 2,000 demons from one guy, those demons were all from that area, Bashan, which is an area that was controlled by the Rephaim. In fact, there are megalithic, megalithic memorials called dolmens there, which are, they think, burial places for giants. There's thousands of them there on the uh, east side of the, the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Thousands. So they think that might be part of it. Don't know. 
Now also recall the size of the army that was summoned by the unholy trinity back in Revelation 16, 13. 200 million. Well, they, we had 200 million, but we have all these armies now showing up. They're all coming in. So yeah, this is, these are the armies coming into the promised land to do the final thing to Israel. So prior to that happening, it looks like that the beast and the false prophet have left Babylon. They've gone into Israel with their troops and they're going to get attacked. The city's going to be taken down. All is not happy in beast land. The Bible says that. But all those who are aligned with the beast and taken his mark and worshipped his image are possessed by demons. Okay? That's what this seems to indicate. Now we know, thanks to Jesus in Mark 5, that demons do have no problem going condo if they have to. Okay? And Mark 5, verses 12 to 15, is the story about the the one guy with 2,000 demons. The demons implored Jesus, saying, Send us into the swine so that we may enter them. And Jesus gave him permission. And coming out, the unclean spirits entered the swine, and the herd rushed down a steep bank into the sea, about 2,000 of them, and they were drowned in the sea. By the way, in that area of the country, it was Gentile. They worshipped Jupiter, and they worshipped Zeus, and they, they did all of that. And they sacrificed pigs to them. So they just destroyed the entire economy of, of idol worship when that happened. It just, all of a sudden, there's nothing to sacrifice anymore. They just drowned themselves in the Sea of Galilee. Their herdsmen ran away, reported it in the city and in the, in the country, and the people came to see what had happened. They came to Jesus and observed the man who had been demon-possessed, sitting down, clothed in his right mind, and the very man who had had the legion, they became frightened. All these people who are living in this rebuilt Babylon, yeah, they're involved with this world economic powerhouse that's been built there that is, everybody has to have the mark, and everything's going through computer systems that are based right there in Babylon. Everything's controlled for Babylon. I mean, everything. So let's look at verse 2 again. He cried out with a mighty voice, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. Why is it fallen? Okay, because she's become a dwelling place of demons and a prison of every unclean spirit and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. Now the word prison in the Greek is philake. It's just a place for wild animals and evil spirits to dwell. It's a haunt, a lair, a dwelling place, okay? But it can also mean a prison or the act of guarding. Now again, remember, some of the demons had been held in prison for thousands of years before they released, and when they were released they did one thing, they killed people. These demons are possibly so dangerous that even the enemy's got to have, have to have them guarded. There may be a group of them already there under guard, and they're dangerous, even for the enemy. He can't let them run around because they're just, they're just that dangerous. It could also, and we've talked about this too because we've talked about the lie. What is the lie? With everything that's going on today, it could be, well, yeah, flying saucers will come down and, you know, Spirit Brothers, well, you know, it could be a reference to all of the fact that all these alien spaceships landed at Babylon when they can't go anywhere anymore because they've been kicked out of heaven. So the transportation devices are all parked right there. Don't know. Could be. I'm just throwing out different ideas, but the bottom line is Michael kicked them out and they had to go someplace. So it's a, this place is the, it's where the unholy trinity is based, it's where the beast and the false prophet is based. It's where the dragon is doing business with them. It's where the computer systems for all of the uh, economy of the world is passing through this. Of course, they're using cloud-based systems, and they're, but still, at the end of the day, you're going to still have to have a base for it someplace, and it's here. And in the dark, all of a sudden, the angel shows up and says, you're getting what's coming to you. Babylon will also be a prison of every unclean and hateful bird, Dr. MacArthur puts it this way, the phrase symbolizes that the city is going to be totally destroyed and like birds, the demons are going to hover over the doomed city waiting for its fall. The picture is, what does heaven think of demons? Unclean, hateful birds. Carrion birds. So, I mean, he's taking a picture. If you think like a Jew, a carrion bird is unclean. You don't want anything to be with them. You don't want to be there. You'd come home like I do sometimes and find 35 buzzards on the top of the house because something died on the road back there. You're wondering, why am I going in the house? It's because something died on the road back there. They're just waiting for dinner to get done. 
But not for a Jew. A Jew would say, oh, wait a minute, that's a sign. There's something to this. So when you start thinking that way, all of a sudden it makes sense. Yeah, this is characteristic of demons. Again, verse 3. For all the nations, this is another reason why the city's going down. All the nations have drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. So here in verse 3 we have another reason as to why everything is happening to Babylon. It is the center of all economic activity in the world. The entire planet, everything goes through that. I'm sure that makes a lot of countries who have been kind of real happy about that. All the kings of the earth had to take note of this. They had to allow it to occur. And by using the term of the earth, we recognize this is not spiritual power. This is what men had to do. Men had to allow this to happen, and they did. The economic activity that takes place at Babylon, which is planet-wide, came with a price. You can't do business unless you take the mark and worship the image. Of course, if you do that, based on what the angel said earlier, it's eternal damnation. Period. No hope for salvation at all. That's why some say, well, it could be genetic modification, they're no longer human. It's possible, don't know. Those who do not take the mark, though, have only persecution to look forward to. And death. They can't buy anything, they can't sell anything. Unless they have the mark. Now, Jeremiah talks a little bit about this as well. In Jeremiah 51, verses 7 to 9, Babylon has been a golden cup in the hand of the Lord, intoxicating all the earth. He's talking about the same thing. The nations have drunk of her wine. Therefore, the nations are going mad. I like the way that Jeremiah puts it. They've, they've all dealt with the commercial success that is Babylon. He's not talking about the Babylon that's existing when he's there. He's talking about this future Babylon. And the nations are going mad. Suddenly Babylon has fallen and been broken. Wail over her. Bring balm for her pain. Perhaps she may be healed. We applied healing to Babylon. She was not healed. Forsake her and let us each go to his own country, for her judgment has reached to heaven and towers up to the very skies. And we'll see that same language used here in the book of Revelation. Babylon, in her political character, has a relationship with all the nations. And it's economic, but it's also evil. And it's described in the Bible as fornication. They've led by the rulers, the kings of the earth. And this evil association has made all the merchants of the earth rich. So you have commercial activity going on too. Now we talked about the first religious Babylon, which had become rich, right? And the beast took it down. God eliminated the apostate church by using the beast. And the beast destroyed it. And then took all that wealth. So imagine the wealth of the Greek Orthodox Church, the Catholic Church, the Mormons, the, all of it. it. takes all of it. So that's what, that's what happens. It was originally collected through the influence of the apostate church, and they, of course they obtained additional wealth as they went along. As we had discussed last week when we were looking at Zechariah chapter 5, verses 5 to 11, Zechariah prophesied the development of an economic powerhouse in the last days in the plains of Shinar. That's what that flying pot is all about. Zechariah's vision, uh, per Dr. Morris, says that it clearly foretells a time when the center of world finance and commerce will no longer be in New York, it won't be in Geneva, it'll, it'll be in Babylon, in the plains of Shinar. And, the, and that's the scriptural reference that I use to say it, they're going to rebuild Babylon, because it says Shinar, that's where it's going to be. Prophets usually speak pretty clearly when they say where something's going to be. The computer systems to run all of this, and of course, yeah, it's going to be cloud-based, and yeah, it's going to be multiple different locations, and I get that. But it's based right there. And if you are not only attacking the city, but at the same time doing a cyber attack on the entire network, which is what will probably be happening as well, you can take the whole thing down, and they're going to. And it's going to happen, as it says in the Scripture, in one day, all of it. All buying and selling, though, for three and a half years has been done using this system worldwide. 
they've been using the system to monitor people. They've been using the system to monitor people's activity. What are they buying? What are they selling? You know, it, it, we talked about that be before as well. This is, this is Alexa on steroids. You know, this is when you walk home at night, uh, Alexa is going to want to know whether or not you worship the beast today, and if not, I'll throw an image up so you can worship, and by the way, show me your hand so I can make, let you have dinner. I mean, it's, it's almost that, that pervasive. The nations are sucked in, the merchants are all, everybody's involved in this. In Ezekiel chapter 27, there's a city that's destroyed called Tyre. And it's a picture of the destruction of Babylon here in Revelation 18. So if you take a look at, and I'll let you take a look at Ezekiel 27 on your own, but here's a section out of it, verses 32 and 33. Moreover, in their wailing, they'll take up a lamentation. And this is the, the merchants and the nations. Who is like Tyre, like her who is silent in the midst of the sea? When your wares went out from the seas, you satisfied many peoples. With the abundance of your wealth and your merchandise, you enriched the kings of the earth. When you read about the fall of Tyre, it sounds like the fall of Babylon. It, it just really does. It's a picture. So let's take a look at Revelation 18, verses 4 and 5. I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people. Okay, so who would that voice be if it's saying, it's my people? It's Jesus. It's God, okay? That's, that's who's speaking. I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, so that you will not participate in her sins and receive of her plagues, for her sins have piled up as high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. There are believers in Babylon, even with the mark of the beast stuff going on. Now we know, because of what it says in verse 13, that some of them are there as slaves, because that's one of the things that's being traded, is slaves. It also says souls in verse 13 too, and these are people who are being held to be put to death. So you've got slaves, you've got, and apparently with all of this stuff that's going on, they're going to be able to escape. Okay, so God's saying, get out of there. Again, this is, the whole world hears this. And if you're, you know, somewhere else and you hear this, you know, you're probably going to want to get out of town too. But are there believers there who are actually working, who don't take the mark? This makes it sound like there are. It's not the first time we've seen believers in the Scriptures involved in a community that they had no business being in. Okay? Remember a guy by the name of Lot being someplace where he shouldn't have been? Back in Genesis 13, verses 10 to 13, so you get to say, not only is Lot the picture of the believer being rescued by God in the rapture, but he's also a picture of a believer not being where they need to be. Lot lifted up his eyes and saw all the valley of the Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. That was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. If you look at this place now, it's not well watered everywhere. It's the Judean desert, and it's about 1,000 feet below sea level. Like the land of Egypt as you go to Zoar. So Lot chose for himself all the valley of the Jordan, and Lot journeyed eastward. Thus they separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled in the cities of the valley and moved his tents as far as Sodom. So he, he moved toward Sodom, but didn't move in. Okay? Now the men of Sodom were wicked exceedingly and sinners against the Lord. Yeah, they were. They were involved with doing things with an, uh, fallen angels. They were involved with doing things with each other. They, you name it, they were doing it. Genesis 19.1. Now two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and where's Lot now? sitting in the gate of Sodom. Oh, that is a huge change from camping outside of town. He's now sitting in the gate of Sodom. Lot is no longer living in or near Sodom. He's in the gate. This means he has become one of the rulers of the city. He is now part of the governing structure of Sodom. And he's there greeting people on behalf of the government. Hi, welcome to Sodom. Come into my house, because you won't like staying in the park. I mean, it means he was exercising some kind of judicial function. That's what it means. Verse 9. Now, the city of Sodom finds out these two angels are there, and again, part of their sin in Sodom was that they were also dealing, they were also repeating what happened in Genesis chapter 6. Okay? This was going on as well. 
Plus, they were doing things that they shouldn't have been doing sexually. I mean, they just weren't. So they're trying to get to these two angels, and they said, stand aside. Furthermore, they said, this one came in as an alien, and already he's acting like a judge. Things had changed. Lot is not where he's supposed to be. He's made some compromises, and he's now part of the ruling elite of the town. So they pressed hard against Lot and came near the door. This, by the way, is a cycle that gets repeated over and over and over again, where God warns, and God's warning us with the story about, about Lot. In 1 John, John kind of warns about it too, and he's saying, hey, don't be taken in by the, by the things of the world. In chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, he says, all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, but it's from the world. The world's passing away and also its lusts, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. You know, you stop and think about people being in the wrong place. I stop and think that the guy who was the press secretary for Saddam Hussein was a Christian. Figure that one out. Really? He was the, pre yeah, he was. He got put to death for it, too. It's all about what city do we want to live in? Where, where do we want to live? Do we want to live in Babylon? Where do we want to live? In Jerusalem. It's going to come up one last time at the final destruction of Babylon. There's going to be one last warning as we're seeing. And some will flee who did not worship the beast, did not take part of the economic system. They may be there working. They may be there slaves. They may be there. I mean, if they're there as slaves or they're there imprisoned, they're, they're going to get out as best as they possibly can. But if they're there working, why are they there working? You ever met people who say they're believers and you sit there and go, but why are you doing that job? You know? I was stationed at Nellis Air Force Base in Las Vegas. And I'd run into people and say, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Christian. Well, well, where do you work? Well, I work down at Caesar's Palace. I'm a dealer. Why do you have that job? I mean, that, that's it, it's just a question. I know that's an issue that the church is there who deal with people who come to Christ and they have to disciple them and eventually they go, oh, I shouldn't be doing that. You know, but they, you got you to gotta take them there. You have to bring them there and let them grow in the Lord. But there are people who make this choice. In Hebrews chapter 11, verses 13 to 16, this is part of the, 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 those in faith. All these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. That's what we are. We're not earth dwellers. Remember, this is all earth dweller, earth dweller, earth dweller. Believers aren't earth dwellers. This is not our home. We don't live here. We're aliens. Those who say such things make it clear that they're seeking a country of their own. We're seeking what the Lord has for us. That's the city we're looking for. We're looking for the new Jerusalem. You know, all of us as believers already are on the citizenship papers of New Jerusalem, okay? I don't know what street we're going to live on, but I mean, I, but we already have citizenship papers there, thanks to what Jesus did on the cross. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had an opportunity to return, talking about Abraham. But as it is, they desire a better country, and that's a heavenly one. Therefore, God's not ashamed to be called their God, for he's prepared a city for them. Jeremiah talks about this moment too in chapter 51 verse 6. He's not talking about the folks who are, in, who are going to be held captive in Babylon as a result of the captivity. He's talking about this moment. Flee from the midst of Babylon and each of you save his life. Do not be destroyed in her punishment for this is the Lord's time of vengeance. He is going to render recompense to her. We're so glad you tuned in to today's edition of The Unsafe Bible with Pastor Ken. For more information about this ministry and what we believe, you can find all you need to know at theunsafebible.com. Want to hear more messages from Revelation? We've got that too. Just look under the Media tab. As you've been listening to this teaching in Revelation, what are some of the things that come to mind? What are some of the questions that might be sprouting up in you about God and His ways of doing things? One thing that's a proven fact is that the things that are prophesied about in the Bible most assuredly come about. This may be comforting to you in many regards, but when you read Revelation, it's kind of terrifying to think about. 
wouldn't it be nice to be unaffected by all the terror that's talked about in Revelation? Well, God in His goodness allows for a way out. Would you like to know more about this escape from the end of the world as we know it? We'd love to connect with you about these things. The truth is, it's all about Jesus and believing that He's Savior and Lord. If you have more questions, please go to theunsafebible.com. Find the Connect tab and select I'm New to fill out the form so we can be in touch. If you want any more info on who we are and what we're about, you'll find that on our website as well. That's theunsafebible.com. Well, that's all for today. We hope you'll join us again for another edition in the book of Revelation. Pastor Ken will continue to share some great thoughts next time on The Unsafe Bible.